the loop, sorry. <laughs> How goes it? Oh, you're muted. I can't hear you. You're muted. There we go. Unmute. Oh, you're good. How's you're that? Good. Okay. Uh, perfect. How Are we recording? It? Are we recording right now? Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Should we should we just get going with this or? Uh, yeah, we can just absolutely do it. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, anyhow, thanks thanks for joining me and thanks for joining the class. Thank you for appreciate the it. I'm pumped about it. This honestly, I'm not gonna lie. The class I think is a super awesome idea. I think it's a really, uh, given the circumstances of COVID, uh, even though it's crazy, right? I think the way a way to really get people engaged with artwork is just to show the work. Um, yeah, this is awesome. So I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it. Yeah, it's gonna It's lovely because, uh, you know, the, the fact that um, rather than art history, where they're learning about history, uh, you know, artists from a book, they're actually learning art from artists. So mm -hmm. um, that's mm -hmm. why, you know, from it's from right from the horse's mouth. So Definitely, it's, it's right? you know, yeah. yeah, our struggles, our struggles. <laughs> you're right especially with people who make work about a struggle uh, yeah 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 it's yeah, like definitely. especially in this climate too you know it's mm -hmm. just been crazy yeah. so yeah I, um, I actually i'm sorry go ahead yeah. go ahead go ahead no no it's just you know this it's uh it just seems like you know everything is just so different uh than it was a year ago so you know just uh yeah. <laughs> yeah. double-edged sword uh i will say i've been to the more talks in the past year than i have been to my entire life <laughs> so uh that is a, a fact yeah well, um, can you tell the the, uh, the the viewers who will be viewing this um, about uh, about who you are? You just give us a little background. Definitely, yeah. So, um, for those of you that do not know me, which hopefully might be everybody, uh, my name is Andre Ramos Woodard. Uh, I use both they and he, they them and he him pronouns. Uh, I was born in the South. I was born in Nashville, Tennessee. That's my home. That's where I love to be. My extended family is there. So by that, I mean my mom, my not, not anymore, but my mom and my dad were born there. All my cousins and all my aunts and uncles were born there. It has a really, really kind of in integral part of my process. The self and home is so important to me. But um, but yeah, that's, that's where I grew up. That's where I kind of discovered art. As a child, I was really, really into things like anime, comics, just just drawing and, and stuff along those lines. And I always wanted to be within the realm of art. I didn't even know what that even meant. But as a child, I definitely wanted to do that. I found myself always drawing like Yu-Gi-Oh characters or Dragon Ball Z characters, <laughs> characters that I saw, you know, in, in, in cartoons and anime that I just, I know, I just loved them. I was like, if I can't be Yugi Moto, I will at least draw him. Um, so uh, I loved that. And Actually, whenever I moved from Tennessee to Texas, whenever I was in the 10th grade, that was actually during the, uh, early, the late 2000s, before the 2010s, huge recession. My dad got a job offering in Texas and we, our whole family moved. And I remember taking a photography class. And I only took the photography class because it was between photography and PE. And I was not about to run and I was not about to shoot no hoops. Nope, couldn't catch me doing that. So um, I took photography and I didn't like it at first. I don't know why I didn't, no, I know I didn't like it, the teacher. <laughs> um, you know, but then I fell in love with the medium. It, it, the, he taught me so much technicality that after I kind of got that down, I started doing stuff more intuitively. And that was whenever I became really more in tune with what photography could do for me and how I could kind of speak through that medium. But from was, it a, on, was it a uh, film, film, sorry, was it a film fine. class or was it a digital class? It was actually a mix <laughs> of both. Um, okay. And that's a, that's a great question because <laughs> film was one of the reasons that I did not like photography. Um, mm. And I guess I found that to be quite, it's not odd knowing that I'm a 27 year old person, but mm -hmm. I remember being in high school and everyone was like, oh, film, oh, film. And I was like, mm -mm. I don't wanna be in a dark room, takes too long. Mm -hmm. um, but what really, really drew me actually to that was whenever we passed from the first semester on from, the, from film to digital, we learned more like Photoshop. We learned how to use a program called uh, GIMP. Um, I think it was called GIMP, but that's a weird word. Anyway, um, 
so uh, you know, I I just loved the fact that I could take a photograph and manipulate it in Photoshop. That was what I was wanting. And you could do that in film in certain ways, right? But there's a lot more to it. And I'm I'm not as patient. I was <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah dodging and burning oh i'm not even doing the dodging right i think i'll just go to photoshop um yeah. so but yeah it was a it it was both film and digital and the digital aspect was what really drew me in um and from there i went to undergrad in photography at lamar university in beaumont texas mm -hmm. uh got taught by two amazing teachers in photography keith carter and print tv thomas print Keith Carter is a film photographer and Prince Thomas focuses on digital, it, which is so funny. They, their combinations of aesthetic really kind of, really taught me a lot about, about how to go about it, the realm conceptually within the same medium, but in mm -hmm. very, very different aesthetics. It was really, really cool. Um, and from there, I got my undergrad in the end of 2017. And now I'm at the University of New Mexico where I'm getting my MFA in photography. I should be graduating. I better be graduating in three months. Um, so yeah. congratulations. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. How are, how are you gonna have your show? I mean, how is that gonna work? Yeah, that's a, okay. Um, so <laughs> at the University of New Mexico, all of the master students have to find a venue and have their own solo thesis show. And I had this plan before, you know, pre-COVID, um, of course, that, but COVID. So I'm still gonna thankfully have that space. It's a really nice space. It's kind of like a renovated garage or barn. Um, and I'm gonna hang the work like I normally would in the exhibition. And if people are going to be there, which I don't think people will, um, if they are going to be, it'll be a, by appointment, socially distant opening, um, mm -hmm. which is a very specific thing, but the safety of the people is significantly more important than the work on the wall, I must say. Um, mm -hmm. And other than that, I will try my best to do everything virtually. I know I'm gonna have a virtual talk for sure, mm -hmm. because I, not only is that really the best option because of the circumstances, I think it's a really, one of the, one of the few uh, really fruitful thing that's come out of this, especially within the art world, being able to communicate across across the world, really. Um, so I will have a virtual virtual talk, and I'm gonna try to have a virtual reception. Virtual receptions are just kind of weird because it's yeah, not, they're so <laughs> impromptu. Yes, yeah, it's, it's just like let's mingle does you, in this square. Does um, does your work translate to uh, the digital medium? Like if we were to um go to your website which our, our viewers are will be going to um how much of of that translates um to to your work i mean hmm, i think oh wow I, I mean, I, how much would they get out of it would they get 100 percent? i mean if it was a land work they would probably get zero out of it yeah right? So, right yeah i think that they will definitely be able to get most of it there are some mm -hmm. small things that i've started to add more in grad school like I'm starting to mix media. I'm starting to use photography with illustration and drawing. So maybe just the, the mark that I make on the paper will not be as visible or as clear. The size, of course, is scale is a thing that I'm, I'm differentiating, differentiating scale. But for the most part, most of my pieces are meant to, not meant to be, but are very readable in a digital format. There are, there is one piece that is only really read in digital format it's a video but there is another piece that's a flag right that one i think is best seen in person so most but there will be some kind of some experiences that i really wish would i would be able to throw through the screen but i can't do that would you you know some people make artists books um would, or catalogs um mm -hmm. did you think about uh, about that medium Yes, actually, it's required. <laughs> I do have to. Oh, it is okay. <laughs> I, yeah, I have to have a catalog for my thesis. But um, what what something that's interesting about that to me is that the school lets me do it however I want, as long as the committee that I have is okay's that, right? Mm -hmm. So in my catalog, I am going to have the work, you know, physical documentation of the work in the space and the work, mm -hmm. and a written a written element. I'm not sure what that written element will be but I do want to write. I think that my thesis, uh, without going too more into it before we show the work is about blackness 
And I think mm -hmm. it's going to be very important for me to kind of tell a narrative, portray a story, and or give some factual evidence um, in that catalog. So there will be a writing element. I just haven't completed it yet. <laughs> <laughs> and how, how, uh, how's it live, living in uh, Albuquerque? It's pretty cool. I will say um, I came from a pretty conservative town. Um, and so Albuquerque is nowhere near as conservative. And as a person of color, as a queer person, as a non-binary person, those it's, it's, it's much better living in here. I, can, I feel more myself in here, in Albuquerque, and that's great. Um, mm -hmm. And also you and the University of New Mexico, especially my department, the photography department. Oh, they are <laughs> so always on point. They are <laughs> always have my back. They are not only always have my back, but they always can get critical too. They can say, mm -hmm. let's talk about, let's engage with your work. Let's sit here and really think about what you wanna do. They can tell me things they think are not working and are working. They can tell me things that I can take out of my ear and just throw away, but they can tell me things I can grab onto as well. And I love all of that. So mm -hmm. my experience overall in Albuquerque, especially as an artist has been, has been great. And it's also like one of the top programs in the country, top fo photo programs in the country. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I will say that is a reason I got, I got, <laughs> I'm here. I am super blessed, I think, to be in a program like this. Um, it is one of the top 10 photo programs in the country. It's got great facilities. The teachers are awesome. Yeah, it's a it's a cool program. I'm happy. Yeah. I am. Yeah. <laughs> and you and you only got three more months. So hey. yes, yes, <laughs> I am moving back to Houston after I finish. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm gonna try to, you know, throw my resume at anyone. Please hire me in the art spaces that you have in Houston. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. We would love to. We would love to show your work out here at some point. Yo, <laughs> don't have to tell me twice. You know what? That's so funny. I uh, have. I just. I'm actually about to go with my husband to pick up my work from Chicago. And now I'm like, gonna go drop it. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to blow, I'm not trying to blow, I swear to God. Uh, <laughs> taking work from one place and then sh dropping it off at another yeah. place. And so mm -hmm. now I'm just like, who else can like take my work so I don't have to keep it in the house? <laughs> Chicago in February, you're very brave. <laughs> yes, it was a 20 hour drive, but it was really fun. I will say it was a really, I love driving. So it was yeah, great. wow. Well, uh, maybe we can uh, turn to your, your um, website and maybe you could, you know, walk us through some of your work. Yeah, let's do that. Let me share my screen. And if you don't mind letting me know if you see it, whenever it's, uh, I think it's, oh, there we go. It's uh, right. starting. There we go. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, I'm just going to drag this over here. Might be important. Okay, so I'm going to start from from the from the beginning, from the work mm -hmm. that I was doing in undergrad. So this body of work is called Exalted Abominations. And I think this is a very good introduction to the way that I make work in general. Mm -hmm. As a photographer, I am very drawn to making work that is about my experience. I always have been and I and even when I was drawing things that were like Yu-Gi-Oh characters, when I was making digital manipulations as a kid about, I don't know, Greek mythology and things like that, they were genuine interests of mine, something that I kind of took out of my personality, even if it was as simple as Yu-Gi-Oh. Um, they were part of me, something that inspired me to be an artist. I love, I, I, that's the way that I make, parts of me come out. And this was the first time that I had really been given, at least in an academic setting, kind of like a balls to the wall, do your own thing, like show me what you got. And I not only did I want to make something that I thought was going to be fun to make, I wanted to make something that was crucial, that was crucial, especially in the, in the, in the place that I lived, in a conservative town, it, you know, walking around, this is my husband, for example. Um, my beautiful husband, his name is Jose. <laughs> you know, in Albuquerque, I can walk around holding his hand and mm -hmm. not feel ashamed or not feel embarrassed. Mm -hmm. um, and when I walked around in Beaumont, I did feel embarrassed. And, you know, now I don't think mm -hmm. I would feel embarrassed, but I would have to look over my shoulder to see who was watching us. That's not how it should be. And mm -hmm. that's what that's what this thesis came out of. I was using the iconography from religion that was implanted into me from a young age, you know, Christianity, 
the symbolism of the halo mm -hmm. Bible verses overlaid onto these individuals, these queer individuals. I was going out of my way to glorify the very people that have been discriminated against by the Christian community. And I'm not saying Christianity is by any means like um, anti people. I am mostly talking about my mm -hmm. experience as a queer person growing up within a religious household. And I'm also not, mm -hmm. I'm not, not only that I am, you know, calling for calling attention to the fact that there are flaws in 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 this religion there are flaws in the way that we interpret things that we see as omnipotent there is nothing like that um you know if we if if we as people consider ourselves to be flawed the things that we create can also not be perfect um that goes mm -hmm. for religion that goes for government that goes for a lot of different things um, it was Are you still there. religious or do, do you, I'm sorry, do you go still ahead. go to church? Do you still go to church? Are you still religious? Or, you know, when oh. you go back home and I know grandma says, come to church with me, do you go to church with her? Or? <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> I'm not religious. I'm not, I would consider myself agnostic, um, meaning that I don't really know if there's a higher power or not, but I'm not going to, I feel like I don't, I don't know. I'm not going to be the one to say it, but I will say um, I do as much as I'm talking about this religion that, dog me out a little bit when I was a kid. Um, I have the utmost respect for the uprising of Christianity, specifically in black culture. Um, and the reason being is as a black man, um, as a black bodied individual, um, you know, going to school, going to church was integral. Um, and even when I didn't want to go to church, it was integral. Um, <laughs> and like learning about the history of African Americans on this, on this country, uh, religion became more of an escape from the negative, awful things that happened to the black body. And it's more than the black body, right? It's people of color, it's oppressed people and working class people. Religion can be a very wonderful escape. So while I don't consider myself to be religious, best believe if I went home and my mama asked me, I would go to church. Um, mostly mm -hmm. to experience that sort of spirituality with her. Even though I don't feel it, I like the community that is brought up by some you know religion in some instances um and so yeah i i know but also the utmost respect in certain cases um mm. but yeah oh i also must say all of these pieces are all of these pieces are titled by a word that was taken out of the bible this one for example is titled mm. sin this one is titled abomination the series is called exalted abominations and what i'm doing is even though even if the text isn't specifically talking about queerness i'm taking out specific words that are kind of hitting the hammer on the head that i feel like kind of place it in a place place it in a very real but very negative place uh for me for me and and my queer community all of the people that were in this were also people from beaumont texas um most of them were friends of mine a few of them were people that were just models, but all of them I interviewed and at least uh, interviewed to at least certify, I guess, that they were comfortable with this and also had an experience that was re relative to the series. If there was a queer person that said, I love Jesus all day, every day, never, then they, that's not right. I wouldn't want them in the series. But all of these people were also marginalized, also oppressed by this very religion that I did as well. And so I think it's really important to tell our story, not just my story. Um, and that's something that I strive to do in the series. Um, so yeah, do, should I go on? I don't want to. Yeah. That, okay. okay. <laughs> yes. I guess I'll yes, just please. <laughs> All right, cool. um, so yeah, that was my my undergrad thesis, and that was really fun. Um, and you know, after that, I started making this work. This body of work is called "I Understand How You Feel." Uh, this was the body of work that I went into grad school with, and I considered this a challenge to myself because as a photographer, as an artist who really enjoyed making manipulated images and digitally manipulated, so pretty heavy Photoshop influence, excuse me, um, or like uh, digital collage influence, I had never myself kind of explored my own concepts or my critical thoughts in straight photography. And what I mean by that is photographs straight out of the camera with very minor editing. I'm not editing out, I'm not uh, editing anything out of the photographs or editing, 
editing, adding anything into them either. Uh, mm -hmm. I take the photograph, I compose that photograph, um, I set it up and I take that shot. And that's how it is um, for the most part. Um, but, you know, I, I think I got some, I don't know, you know, it's, it's weird for me to kind of uh, think about the feedback that I got on this because I didn't like this body of work. And I don't know if I really do love it. Um, I show it because I think it is important. Um, this body of work is called, I understand how you feel. And rather than that, like that's a statement, right? But this body of work to me existed as a question in which I was asking people if they could under my, understand my experience as a, as a male bodied person, specifically with anxiety disorder and depression. Um, how does that go about and can people, can people understand that period? Can people understand that through the visualizations I'm giving them? Um, and if they do, to what extent? These were all questions that were ruminating in my mind. I was finding ways to kind of cope with my thoughts as well. Um, and while this body of work I think was challenging for me personally, and um, I would say I had some fun I just don't make work in this realm, not very often. Um, I ended up putting this work down because it just didn't feel like I was doing what I, I didn't feel like I was getting out of it what I wanted to get out of it. Who so knows, maybe I'll add some stuff to it in the future, but for now, yeah. Well, stylistically, it looks very different from your first body of work, right? I mean, Definitely, yeah. Um, like all, all the images are, are very, very, uh, like very different looking, whereas, you know, there was some in your other body of work, there was always the halo that kind of brought you through the, mm -hmm. the you know, all the images that kind of tied them all together. So definitely. Yeah, that's, that's a good thing to think about as well, because I, um, I think the way that I make work, especially now is quite, I say the word chaotic, I say like an organized chaos. Um, the aesthetic use and exalted abomination absolutely brought it together right um and i and i started to think significantly more about concept like what were these images doing and how do these images relate to each other because of what i want them to say you know as an artist as a photographer um you know i get to make i get to dictate what my work is doing when i make it but when i put it out in the world mm -hmm. Is something else. Um, so I also enjoy that. I enjoy the dichotomy of that. I love the relationship and the uh, juxtaposition that these images have within their own body of work if I'm asking a question about understanding. Um, and so yeah, that's what I really was drawn to. I just, um, I don't know. I don't know. This is a work that I just always end up like, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I do. Maybe you'll come back to it. Maybe you'll yeah, come right? back to it in, you know, in a couple of years. Exactly. Yeah. So who knows? Um, now, okay, let me go. I'm not. I'm going to skip over Hall and Ass and Lexapro because those are videos for now. Um, I'm going to go to a mediocre mm -hmm. ass nigga. And and they can go. They can watch it. Yeah, they'll totally they can watch it. Uh, you know, when after this. So, yeah. yeah, you can feel free to watch it. Hall and Ass is a pretty short video, and Lexapro is really just a playlist um, that is accompanies a mediocre ass nigga. Mm -hmm. um, and this body of work is my ongoing body of work, very much about me. Um, to be quite blunt and to be real, I make work about, so we all know at this point, I make work about me. Um, and going to grad school, being away from my friends and family for the first real time, the stresses of grad school, the stresses of being a black person in a city where the population of black people is 3%. Um, those all affected me in negative ways, very negative ways. I mean, they, my anxiety went up, my depression went up. Um, I experienced like, you know, feelings and thoughts and moods and physical, physical things in my body that I had never experienced before. And it definitely was uprooted because of all of the things that were happening that were causing me so much anxiety. Um, and so a mediocre ass nigga is kind of this weird mix of me experiencing these really negative internal feelings, personal internal feelings uh, as a human being, as a person that has, suffers from ha mental illness. You know, I have a 
major depression. That is something that affects me on a daily basis. Um, but also, I'm a Black person, and I would be lying to say that also does not affect me on a daily basis because of discrimination, because of marginalization, because of the history of the Black body on American soil, you know, because of 2020. Those all affect me. Collective trauma is a real thing. Those, those, those microaggressions, those negative stereotypes, those affect Black people. They affect my health. They absolutely did affect my anxiety and depression, you know, and that's something that I never really thought about before. This work, this work came at, this work came out before I even had the title. I didn't know what I was going to do. I made this work to cope with all the things I just said. I did not know the best way to navigate my own thoughts so crucially, like, you know, having conversations with my husband, for example, couldn't even do that. This body of work allowed me to get some of the things out that I just could not. And I, and I wish I could tell you exactly why I could not, but it just hurt too much. It hurt too much to really interpret these sort of feelings. So a mediocre ass nigga is partially a pun in the sense that uh, when you think about kind of like pop culture or like the dozens or people joking with each other and stuff like that, you'll definitely hear like, oh, you a dumbass person or you're a slow, ass, you know, something hyphen ass. And it's almost humorous. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I, I poke at that. I poke at that, like the African-American vernacular with that, with, that, with that title. At the same time, when you see the N-word to a black person, they will probably keep on moving. To, but to the rest of society, it means something different, right? Um, the way that word is interpreted because of the, per the lips it comes out of is very different. Um, and I'm calling attention to all of that. It's important. It's not, it's not over. It wasn't over when the civil rights movement was passed. It wasn't over on Juneteenth. These things are still happening. You know, black people are getting discriminated against on top of the other things that we have to deal with society, working class people, depression, you know, and this work I, is ongoing for me because it will be ongoing until I am no longer a nigga with depression, um, you know, or until I just feel like I don't need to make it anymore, right? And I feel like that's gonna happen before the other. <laughs> so um, yeah, huh. this body of work is, is constantly adapting um, as, a way to, as a way to cope, as a way to share my experience as a marginalized person as a way to tell other marginalized people, specifically Black people, that I understand their struggle. They are not alone, even if they may feel alone in the way that I do in some of these images. Um, and yeah, this is honestly, I think my favorite body of work that I'm making right now because it is, it's rough, it's raw, it's hard for me to make, but I learn something when I make this work. I get something out of it. And that's what's really great for me. Um, you know, I enjoy it. And now some of our students, you know, are, you know, business majors, biology, biology majors or do, you know, they're, or they make widgets or something. And, okay. and you know, if you're going to make a widget, right, if your profession is to make a widget, you go to your work and you make your widget. And if it's good, it's a good widget. If it's bad, it's bad widget, but mm -hmm. they don't have to reveal any part of their, of themselves in their job. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, isn't it scary to do that to, you know, as an artist, how do you get yeah. to that level? I think it was at first for me. Um, the first time I showed this work, um, to back up a little bit, I was making this work really intuitively. I was kind of just like playing with things and just slow, like vomiting digitally onto computer screens and just making stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, this wasn't work, all of this work wasn't meant to be shown because it was for me. Um, it was for my experience. It was for me to deal with things. Um, and I just, wanted to show it and it, I, I don't know I just really wanted to show it it was really rough because I felt like I was taking not only my vulnerability out and putting it in a space and letting people like look at me when even when I was gone but they also got to interpret it when I was gone right that means anything can come forth they don't have to see it the way I see it and that was scary you know and also saying saying these things I also am you know raise my hand I deal with things that people don't want to deal with I think about things people don't want to think about. 
um, you know, that is not easy, especially growing up in a society, even though it's gotten better, where people have downed the severity of mental health. Um, but I mm -hmm. overcome that by knowing how crucial it is for people to understand that this is a real thing. I mean, mm -hmm. I would love loved in my art history class to see someone that can work about depression. I really would have. Um, didn't see a whole mm -hmm. lot of it. And if I did, it was like, oh, Vivian Meyer, after she died, she might have had some stuff like that was about her personal experience mm -hmm. as a lonely person. But, you know, I, you know, people definitely need to know that not only are their work, is their work coming from different avenues of experiences, from people from all different colors and all different continents and all different, like just direct experiences with life. But these things are all, some of these things are shared. You know, there is, there people, not just me, deal with these things. And as much, as hard as it is to put it out there, it makes me happier to know that there is someone out there that will look at this and say, oh my God, I'm not alone. That's just like the bottom line for me. It helps me a lot to know that. Um, and if there's people making work about, you know, you know, I, people make work about the, the medium of photography itself, people make work about the land, that is fine. Make the work you wanna make, absolutely. But this is the work I wanna make because I feel like it makes, I feel like it not only it makes a difference for me, but I hope for it to make a difference to somebody else. Now, some of these images have writings on them. Is that, uh, is that, uh, did you paint it on or is that photoshopped in or how? Yeah, um, you know, it's a mix of you, both. Uh, um, so this one, for example, Bad Blood. Um, or cutting up transparencies and, and putting the transparencies one on top of the <laughs> Yeah, I, there's Nobody does that I, anymore. <laughs> no, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I really like, to play with you guys. <laughs> I love uh, <laughs> to mess with the viewer. Um, just because like, for example, this piece, Bad Blood is completely in Photoshop. I drew that on with mm. a digital pencil on Photoshop with a brush on Photoshop. That tape is a uh, tape that I bought uh, digitally. Um, you know, that is not, that's not real. Um, but there are other images if I can find another image. Well, like for this one, for example, I've drawn on my dad's photograph. This is not a physical illustration. This is completely digital. Um, this one is not. I printed out a glossy image and used masking tape to tape it over a matte image. I think there's something kind of about the, um, I don't know, there's something that's more visceral about the physical mm. act of doing something. And sometimes it just needs to happen in that way. I would say this is probably one of the most mm. personal pieces in the body of work. It was uh, a body, of, uh, this piece is, I would create it after I had a anxiety attack so bad that I cut off all of my hair. Um, you know, I, I felt mm. like some, I don't know, something just intuitively raw had to happen. And I just, it needed to be there. It just needed to be there and physical in that way. I think for me, um, the juxtaposition between the collage, the digital collage and the physical collage is just how I feel at the moment. Like, how do I feel about that piece? Um, and what are those materials doing? Um, I can also say like this one, for example, even though I'm using text, I was thinking very much about aesthetic, about still life and glamorization um, because mm -hmm. we don't do that with mental health let people look at mental health and the way people look at beauty because it's real. It's just as real, um, you know? And so, I don't know, I just go back and forth. I think whatever, whatever feels best. Um, is that, does that help? <laughs> um, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then I'm going to move on to on a, the last body of work. If, if we're on good time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're doing great. Cool. Awesome. Um, so black snafu, is my latest body of work. This is my thesis work. Um, and so the title, Black Snafu, originates from a series of cartoons called Private Snafu. Private Snafu, those cartoons were created in the mid 1900s during World War II so that they could kind of like comically show uh, the military how to interact with non, like Japanese people, um, mm -hmm. how to 
combat people, how to be militant. It was really, really messed up, very anti-Asian, um, very racist, um, and also very pro-capitalist, very just all messed up, all kinds of messed up. Um, and private snafu, situation normal, all fucked up, was a way that they could kind of show Snafu was the one that was doing everything wrong. Snafu was the, the epitome of what you're not supposed to do. And he was a, he was a comedian in that way. Um, they took this very real issue of the military and br brutality against other countries and made it comical. That ain't funny. The same way they did that to the history of black people with minstrelsy, minstrel shows, blackface, in contemporary cartoons like Tom and Jerry, Mickey Mouse, you know, these, mm -hmm. these very uh, funny, relatable, accessible illustration styles and mediums are still very violent in the history of what it has mm -hmm. done to marginalized people of color. And that's exactly what I'm thinking about with Black Snafu. And Black Snafu, I changed Snafu to niggas, uh, black situation, niggas all fucked up because I'm going about this in a very black centric way. I'm taking, uh, I'm taking old, sometimes old, but mostly old racist depictions of black people and juxtaposing them with photographs that I think are mostly more either celebratory or accurate of the black experience. So for this one, for example, those dreads that I cut off, I juxtapose with Mickey Mouse dressed as Topsy. For those of you that don't know who Topsy is, Topsy was born out of Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, a menstrual character with quote unquote nappy hair. Um, and it's so I say nappy because any anything that's aestheticized as black was anti-white, was not, and by white, I mean, it wasn't good. So you take Mickey Mouse mm -hmm. and dress him up as this whore, as this, as Topsy. And even though Topsy is black, it's synonymous with negativity for some reason, because that's what they wanted it to seem like. But that's not how I see my dreads. Uh, and that's never how I will see my dreads. Um, I, I, I continue to think about, I don't know, the way that these, these minstrels have epitomized stereotypes against me. Um, mm -hmm. And I also think about characters that are more uplifting. Uh, this is a, this is super, this is the Superman version of John Henry. Um, John Henry, the person who used two hammers to beat, um, oh my gosh, a, a slave tale where he, an African slave tale where he used two hammers to like beat a giant machine that was digging a hole. I mean, I should know more than that, but it was crazy. But anyway, um, I took this powerful <laughs> black male icon, this powerful black male icon, this like stoic, not even angry, right? But just this righteous icon and took him and juxtaposed him with the most disgusting thing I've seen in a long time, which apparently is the American flag. Um, because of what the American flag symbolizes to me, uh, mm -hmm. especially with the upheaval of what's going on this past year. Um, so these juxtapositions may not be pretty, uh, but they are accurate in other ways. If this isn't accurate, then this is. This definitely, this uh, black face doll or this black doll reminds me of some of the very dolls that black people made growing up so that they could have dolls that look like them. This mm -hmm. illustration of a black woman, a black girl who actually in the cartoon has a voice deeper than a grown man's is not funny. It's, not, it's, it's nothing but epitomizing how we see black people. Um, so I guess I can't help but in this work very critically analyze these illustrations and how they affected black culture, right? Like, how these disgusting negative minstrels, how their em emphasis on their lips and noses, how does that make people see black people? And also Oscar Proud from the Proud family. Uh, and this episode, he calls out the fact that Black History Month is the shortest month of the year. This is called reparations. You know, I think about the ways that black people have also weaponized this, this medium of illustration and cartooning against, against American history. Um, so that being said, this body work is still, I would say it's, it's ongoing. Um, I have a few pieces, but I have enough pieces for a thesis, but not enough pieces for a big show. So I'm <laughs> making some work. Um, 
but yeah, I also now this body of work or this this genre of work. What would it be called? Would it be social practice or what? Where where would it? Um, I don't know all of the the you know. I stopped. I think at postmodernism. So <laughs> you're good. No, hmm, hmm, hmm. that's a good question because I never really thought about it like that. I mean, I think about nothing more than me being a contemporary artist, but I definitely think of myself as an activist as well, or trying to use my work as activism um, mm -hmm. to, to, to call attention to things. You know, social practice, I think, is very much in the, in the right vein. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. I think my, I'm sorry, did we, we about to ask them? No, no, no. Um, go ahead. Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, no, I uh, I want my work to be significantly more than um, something that is cool to look at. Um, I want it to relate to definitely, definitely the way that we view the world, the way that we inhabit space, the way that we see the people around us. You know, yeah, social practice, I think would be perfect. I think it's a perfect way to describe the work. Um, and now, how, um, how, do, how would a person, uh, let's say a white person who's religious, um, is heterosexual, mm -hmm. uh, if they looked at your work and, you know, how would, what would they gain out of that? You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. So uh, as a person in that, in that state, so that person has a lot of privilege, uh, white privilege, mm -hmm. Uh, male body privilege, cisgender pri privilege, heterosexual, like, you know, there's a lot of privileges there. Um, mm -hmm. And in order, especially as those people in the privileges, like privileges of power, in order to really mm -hmm. learn your place in society, and what I mean is how society has put you on a pedestal, you have to unlearn, mm -hmm. you have to, at the very least, go out, to, you have to go out of your way to try to understand the things that you will never be able to understand. A white person will never mm -hmm. understand the experience of a marginalized black person. They will never know what it is like to be called a N-word and that means something. That's not how that works. Mm -hmm. So that my work mm -hmm. is meant to tell these sort of stories. I would love for someone who doesn't know what any of this means to ask the question, who are these characters? Who are these characters? Mm -hmm. These characters, this is Br'er Rabbit from Song of the South. This is a very old racist cartoon, right? Why is it racist? Do you not know why it's racist? Let's think about that. Let's unpack that a little bit. They took these menstrual characters, mm -hmm. they took these fun, cute characters and gave them black vernacular to epitomize them in a negative way in dialogue with the slave that was telling the story of the whole, like narrating pretty much the whole thing, right? So. You have these people or people that are in positions of power. What my work can do for you is plant a seed, plant a seed. If you don't know why I'm making this work, it is your job to learn. Not, you will not be taught everything because I was not taught everything in school. You know, I didn't know what Juneteenth was until I graduated from college. It shouldn't have been like that. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to realize the things like, you know, me as a non-binary person, I don't know the trans woman experience, but I'm gonna go out of my way to learn about that experience. I will. I don't know the disabled experience. I will go out of my way to learn that. I don't know about the indigenous native experience. I will go out of my way to learn that. So we as people in powers of, like people in positions of privilege, I have male body privilege. I have able body privilege, right? I have an education. I have to unlearn the things that are questionable. I have to go out of my way to look at things in a different way. Um, and I think that that's what my work can definitely offer people that uh, don't understand my struggle. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thanks so much. I mean, this has been really educational for me and I just, I, I've been loving looking at these images. They're just so beautiful. And uh, like I said, we got to get them out here. We got to get the show. Let's go, I'll rent a <laughs> U-Haul. <laughs> 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 well, thanks so much. Thanks again. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Yoshi. Yeah, whenever I um, whenever I have my work up and stuff, I'll I'll shoot you some pictures. I would love to share it with you. Yeah, that'd be great. Nice. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And also, I don't know if this is random or weird. That being said, um, if anyone in the class happens to have any questions for me, or would just love to know more about my work. Uh, feel free to email me, share my email with them. They, you can definitely do that. I'd love to, I'd love to talk more about it. Great. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure you're going to get a lot of, a lot of emails. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. 
So, yeah. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.